Thank you all for joining us for today's talk in the CJS Noon Lecture Series, Reading Japanese Hisho in the Post-Critical Age, which will be given by Dr. Mia Bigoto of University of Kentucky. I'm Erin Brightwell. I'm faculty in Asian Languages and Cultures and today's MC. And so I will start us off with just a few announcements before we get to the meat of today. Next week, please join us on Thursday, February 3rd at noon for a talk by Yusuke Shindo, the Consul General of Japan in Detroit. He will be speaking on Japan, people, society, tradition, and its relations with the US. For this event and future programs scheduled in this series, please check out our CJS events page and or our various social media. As you all have already ascertained, due to updated guidance from the University of Michigan in regards to our COVID policy, this lecture will be in webinar format. Your webcams and microphones have been muted, but we invite you to use the Q&A to submit questions at any time throughout the lecture and the presenters will try to address as many as possible. And now it is my great pleasure to remotely welcome Dr. Miyabigoto, whom I have known since graduate school, where she was the lone modernist who would appear in pre-modern Japanese literature seminars. Now I am saying this not to embarrass her by hearkening back to our student days, but to really call attention to her rare literacy in both pre-modern and modern Japanese literature. And I point this out because it's this kind of refusal to hew to conventional discipline, to hew to conventional disciplinary boundaries that is one of the things that makes Dr. Goto's work so interesting. She is joining us today from, as I said, University of Kentucky, where she is currently assistant professor of Japanese. Dr. Goto specializes in the literature, a category her work is in part deconstructing, of the Meiji period, and she has two recent publications related to this. The first is Constitutive Aporia of Literature, The Case of Kitamura Tōgoku's Theory of Literature, which appeared in Japan Forum in 2019. And then more recently, there, she has the article, My Hime and the Space of Criticism in Meiji Japan, which appeared in 2020, in the Journal of Japanese Studies. Now today, she'll be sharing with us part of the work in her current book project, which is titled Critical Failures, Theory and Practice of Literary Criticism in Late 19th Century Japan. So please join me in giving Dr. Goto a warm virtual welcome, and I will turn the floor over to her. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brightwell. Um, it is really nice um, to, to think of um, our graduate school experiences um, together. Um, it was, it really was a very, very great experience. Uh, so let me share my screen first uh, before I forget. Um, so. Um, I hope everyone can see the slide on the title page of the slide. Uh, if not, please do let me know. So um, again, uh, I really want to thank Dr. Brightwell and the University of Michigan Center for Japanese Studies for inviting me to present my current work with the university community. And um, originally this event was planned to be an in-person lecture. And then I was really looking forward to visiting your campus um, the event had to go online, unfortunately, but I am still very excited for the opportunity and then appreciative of the Center for Japanese Studies, um, Barbara, Jillian, Yuri, and then others who worked hard to make this happen. So thank you very much. So today's talk is based on my book project, which revolves around a question of how to read, how we read, because we all read. Although when we read something, what exactly are we reading in the text? Especially when we have to read something in a critical way, how exactly are we supposed to perform the critical component of the reading? I begin my talk with these questions because these questions are very familiar to many of us who study literature as professional critical readers in contemporary North American academia. 
the ongoing debate about different modes of reading in literary studies. And a major point of contention in those debates is how to read in a critical way. Today's talk is my attempt to approach this familiar question, and then I will do so by turning to late 19th century Japan, Japan's Meiji period, during which an intellectual reading practice called hihyo, or criticism in English, came to be popular. And then I will try to connect Meiji Japan's hihyo, or criticism, to our here and now in the hope of addressing the question of how to be critical in our reading practice, the question that we face through our own profession. I suggest that by looking at Meiji Japan's attempts to read things in a critical way, we may be able to refresh our common understanding of criticism and then open ourselves up to new possibilities of what critical reading might look like. Our first look, Meiji Japan might not seem to be a place that helps us tackle the question. There is over a hundred years of temporal distance between the late 19th century and now. In addition, Japan is inarguably a marginal area when seen from North America. Nevertheless, contrary to the general assumption that a local case from the distant past has little in common with our here and now, there is a strange, somewhat surprising parallel between major Japan and the disciplines of the humanities in the contemporary academia, especially when it comes to the question of how to read. In the same way that those of us in the humanities in the current century are pushed and are pulled from multiple directions to reflect on how we could possibly engage with what we read in a critical way, the emerging generation of Japanese youth in the late 19th century struggled to realize what being critical might be. It is this struggle to envision what criticism might be and what it could become that bring together readers in the 21st century and Japanese intellectuals from the fantasy akla. So the idea of criticism, reading something critically, became very important in Japan towards the end of the 19th century. Here, I quote one claim that the then leading intellectual figure Tokutomi Soho made in 1888. Soho said, Japan at the present moment is in the, in the age of hihyo. It was not just Soho, but many other intellectuals at the time similarly promoted hihyo as a vital practice for the country. Why was that? Why did hihyo gain strong traction among the intellectuals in the late 19th century? Before I open my answer to the question, I want to take a detour and then first look at this image because I think this illustration explains a historical backdrop against which Soho made his claim. So this is an illustration of a fair, a national fair, and then it was included in a general reference book called A Collection of Practical and Useful Matters for the People of Great Japan. This reference book came out in 1886, the second decade of the Meiji period. It's a book that focuses on the basic knowledge of people's daily needs, including new legal regulations, new customs, and new technologies that have been introduced in Japan. It's an illustrated book with many visual images to help the general readers understand things new, things unfamiliar, but important to them. I want to draw your attention to this booth uh, that appears on the left side of the illustration, which features uh, books that are supposed to be useful in the contemporary world. And then if you look closely, you will find different types of books here. Some are bound in Japanese style with strings on their back and some are bound in a different style with hard covers. 
some are written in Japanese or possibly in Chinese or in some variants of sinographic renditions, while some others show English or other European languages on the cover. So in short, what is represented here is a jumble of information written in multiple languages and presented in various forms. And then we can actually read in this image several factors from social historical factors to material ones that facilitated the rise of Hihyo. First of all, in late 19th century Japan, information varying in contents and forms was circulating widely on the market. The information was drawn from multiple corpuses of knowledge, uh, at least Anglo-European and Sinographic, which were placed next to each other and in negotiation with one another. But where did those books, especially the ones written in Roman alphabets come from? And why were those falling books available to the general public? This is because Japan at that time was much more closely in contact with Euro anglo american countries than before and actively importing knowledge from those places. The 19th century witnessed imperial expansionism on the global scale and East Asia was one of the regions in which the global power hierarchy was vividly pronounced. This historical context did not leave Japan untouched. While China had been divided and semi-colonized by multiple forces just across the shores, Japan under the Tokugawa shogunate entered into more open, wider diplomatic relationships with the falling powers in the mid 19th century, when the regime was replaced in the late 1860s, the new Meiji state immediately and proactively had to take steps to avoid the fate of being colonized. Japanese elites at the time were well aware of the country's predicament they started to import a vast range of information, books, and technologies to equip themselves with anything necessary to maintain the country's independence. In that context, for many major elites, Hihyo emerged as a civil Western tradition that would guide and cultivate the Japanese mind, and by extension, pave the way for a new strong nation state capable of rivaling colonial forces. Hihyo was considered as one of the crucial determinants of the country's course of action. In relation to this global colonial context, Hihyo was necessitated for the practical reason at the time when Japan saw a sudden surge of publications. You can see in the image that books are stacked up high and there are piles and piles of them. The number of newly published titles doubled between 1881 and 1888 and tripled in 1890. The 1880s so witnessed a material abundance of publications, the high volume of newly bound items that were to be circulated, purchased, and consumed. The sudden increase of published items meant the growth of print industry and that was prompted by the introduction of new print technologies such as metallic movable type and steam presses, the building of more reliable infrastructure such as trains that could transport items and the development of faster distribution systems. So facing the books, papers and journals in abundance, literate but not so wealthy readers needed a guide reliable advice with which they could select efficiently what to spend their money and time on. He who was posited as one such device that could help readers make wise decisions about their investment. Furthermore, he who became vital to some Japanese youth because their survival as elites in Meiji Japan hinged upon it, or at least so they believed. We can see in the illustration, a mother speaking to the bookseller, a father closely examining a copy. Both the mother and then the father figures have children by their size. In general, 
aside from the late 19th century Japan, um, generally, it is important for parents to think about the children's education and then maybe to buy books for them. But in late 19th century Japan, it was particularly urgent for the people of a certain class, the former samurai class, to have strong educational backgrounds. Many of the youth of the samurai class would have inherited the class privileges without any effort if the social hierarchy of the Tokugawa period had persisted. However, the shogunate collapsed and it was replaced by a new regime. There was no longer the samurai class in the Meiji period, no more class-based privileges guaranteed for them. The younger generations of the former samurai class had to actively readjust and then reinscribe themselves in Meiji Japan's changing social order in order to remain active and valued in society. Luckily, they have been educated, so they knew how to study. So they mobilized their cultural assets to further their education by reading books that had newer information. In so doing, they sought to reconfigure their own social standing as elites. So Hihyo was one practice that they turned to in order to reclaim their status as refined, well-educated individuals that would bring benefit to society. With Hihyo, they could assert, we know the books, so we can tell you which one you should read. So why did Hihyo become so important in Meiji Japan? There were multiple transformative historical, historical forces that were simultaneously at play, the downfall of the shogunate and subsequent social restructuring, global colonial expansionism, and the sudden increase of print. Those factors were interrelated and then together facilitated the valorization of Hihyo as an intellectual reading practice in the late 19th century on a side note, uh, the illustration shows a national fair, which during late 19th century Japan typically offered a site to inculcate the very idea of national by mobilizing people and products. So we can see in this image that the valorization of Hihyo was tightly linked to the emergence of Meiji Japan and its solidification and nationalization processes. But Hihyo, became a serious focus of attention for many image elites. And the strong attention to Hihyo manifested in the material shape toward the end of the 1880s because many journals started to create a separate section dedicated to Hihyo. So here is a list of uh, major intellectual journals that invested in Hihyo at an early stage of the valorization process. Uh, the first one, Central Academic Journal, um, officially established a Hikyo section in February 1886. The women's magazine followed suit in June. And about one year later, monthly reviews of publications was launched. And this journal was Meiji Japan's first periodical that exclusively specialized in Hikyo. The entire journal consisted of Hikyo pieces, essays that evaluated something as Hihyo. The inauguration of this Hihyo-centric periodical prompted another journal, The Nation's Friend, to announce its spatial reorganization in September the same year. And then the journal Nation's Friend created an independent space for Hihyo the following month. Now, we can look at how this particular journal, The Nation's Friend, created an independent section for Hihyo in 1887. I choose the nation's friend as an example here because this journal was quickly gaining popularity among young intellectuals at the time. And it served as an opinion leader among its increasing readership. The fact that this influential journal restructured itself to designate an independent space for Hihyo was already a major statement because it showed that Hihyo was registered as something very important for the broader intellectual community. And then also the journal was founded by Tokutomi Soho who made the claim of Japan being in the age of Hihyo and then Soho served as the chief editor of the journal for a long time. So, 
when the journal reorganized the space in 1887, it was divided into seven subsections and Hihyo was one of them. So these seven subsections uh, marked in the red square included uh, from the right to the left. So the first section uh, included leading editorial articles. The second one, section number two, topics on domestic and international affairs. Number three, special contributions by leading politicians and literati. Number four, letters from readers. Five, essays on literature and politics. And then the sixth section marked in the blue square is a newly created one, Hihyo. And the Hihyo section is defined as the following. Hihyo has both detailed and short pieces, all originally written and variations of newly published books, as well as Hihyo of editorials featured in newspapers and journals. And then the last section, number seven, is miscellaneous on other news and then statistics. So the topics covered in this entire journal varied, ranging from urgent political issues, which was typically discussed in the editorial section number one, to the analysis of statistical data, which was usually included in the miscellaneous section number seven. But the journal as a whole offered a meeting point for these varied topics, but when the section of Hihyo was juxtaposed with these other sections, it helped to create an appearance that each section was equally variable. That's to say, Hihyo section began to appear as an equally important topic to, for instance, domestic political concerns or diplomatic problems. The restructuring of the material space of journals, not just in the nation's friend, but in other intellectually driven journals, occurred like a chain reaction in a relatively short period of time in the late 1880s. Hikyo started to take up space on the surface of many periodicals, and it came to be acknowledged as a general intellectual concern of the time. But there was a major problem. The young elites of Meiji Japan recognized the importance of Hikyo, and yet they could not agree with each other about what Hikyo needed to do. In fact, many of them were unsure about how to practice Hikyo. The strong attention to Hikyo in the late 19th century came with a wide degree of confusion, collective uncertainty as to what Hikyo was and then what it was expected to demonstrate to be critical. So what prompted the confusion? Why were they confused about how to demonstrate the critical component of the practice? To look into the question of why, let's see how one of the leading writers of the time said about Hikyo. I quote here Meiji writer Tsubochi Shoyo's 1887 essay titled The Criteria of Hikyo. Shoyo begins his writing by drawing attention to the incredible change that the scene of writing in Japan witnessed in the past couple of years. The most ex uh, prominent example of the change, according to Shoyo, it is a sudden increase of the sharp Western style hikyo in the publishing world. Shoyo's wording exhibits that Hihyo in the late 1880s was considered a Western practice that took root in Japan only one or two years ago. And then this rhetoric also suggests that there was a discussive trend in late 19th century Japan that received Western criticism as Japanese Hihyo. That's to say, regardless of whether it was a purpose, quality, or effect of the practice, there was a tendency at the time to pursue the commensurability between Western criticism and Japanese hihyo in the practice of reading. In Shoyo's essay, as well as many other writings produced at the time, the Chinese compound hihyo was selected as a common translation of English term criticism. The translingual connection was actually established around this time between English term criticism the Chinese compound hihyo and the rendering of Japanese phonetic alphabets, kuritishizumu, upon the Chinese compound. 
and then many writers used those terms interchangeably. You might think that tra the translational relationship between hihyo, the Japanese term using Chinese compound, and the English term criticism is obvious. And for us, 21st, 21st century readers of Japanese texts, the connection appears transparent almost. However, to the young elites of Neji Japan, the connection was not obvious at all. Why is that? Because they were not disciplined in the way that would consider criticism in English self-evident. Many intellectuals um, at the time, especially those who belonged to the samurai class in the former shogunate era, were typically disciplined in classical Chinese studies. What is classical Chinese studies like? It's a corpus of knowledge, a system of intellectualism that is very different from the institution of knowledge that we are familiar with in contemporary United States. In classical Chinese studies, for instance, we can't really see clear dividing lines between disciplines as we think disciplines should be divided. So sometimes reading classical Chinese texts involved practicing philology, ethics, legal studies, and recitation performance all at once. And then of course, classical Chinese studies heavily relied on reading texts and then commenting on them. There were long genealogies of commentaries and annotations in classical Chinese studies. Born and raised in the 19th century, Meiji elites inherited those traditions and internalized the idea of what reading Chinese texts was like through their childhood education. They knew how to read and how to practice critical reading in their own terms. On the other hand, there was epistemic difference as to what constitutes knowledge, what reading something involves between classical Chinese studies and other corpus of knowledge. What major elites had been familiar with as knowledge and what they encountered in the context of the late 19th century with the introduction of all the books and new information were different. What they had known as critical reading in their genealogies of knowledge was different from what they saw as criticism in the Western genealogies of knowledge. So someone like Shoyo considered Hihyo to be an essentially Western practice that could benefit major Japan. The same goes to Tokyo. Uh, Soho, who said um, Japan was in the age of Hihyo. So those intellectuals understood the difference between the corpuses of knowledge and they thought that they had to do hihyo not in the familiar way, but in the newly introduced Western way. And when they posited hihyo as an important practice for Meiji Japan, when they had in, what they had in mind as hihyo was something completely different from reading practices that had existed in Japan in the genealogies of classical Chinese studies. Hihyo had to be something unprecedented in Japan. And then that prompted the confusion. Meiji intellectuals understood that hihyo was important for them. They also knew that hihyo had to be a critical reading practice. Furthermore, they also understood that hihyo had to be something other than what they had been practicing when they read a classical Chinese text. But what exactly is expected in the practice of hihyo if it had to be different from their norms? What does that mean to read something in a critical way, critical in an unprecedented way? While writers such as Shoyo mobilized the Chinese compound hihyo to parallel the English term criticism, many of them were not able to articulate what exactly they were supposed to do in the name of hihyo. There is a famous anecdote that um, about, about Shoyo. Um, so when Shoyo was attending the university in the English course, um, he wrongly discussed the morality of a Shakespeare's character as part of his criticism assignment. And this anecdote is a telling example of the confusion that major intellectuals felt as to what it takes to read something in a differently critical way. As a result of the ambiguity of Hihyo's boundaries, the discourses surrounding Hihyo at the time proposed abstract 
extremely high ideals of Hihyo without fleshing out its practical details. For instance, for Tokutomi Soho, the task assigned to Hihyo was enormous. As we saw in the image of the National Fair, there were many books written in different languages, formatted in different ways, and the number of publications was, in, was quickly increasing every month. Seeing the influx of information from a diverse range of backgrounds, Soho argued that Hihyo had to make fair selections out of a vast body of existing knowledge, including Western knowledge, and make it relevant to contemporary Japan. It's obvious that no practice could encompass such a wide scope. And another leading intellectual figure of the time, Onishi Hajime, wrote The Theory of Hihyo in 1888. And then in this essay, Onishi discussed the qualifications that the practitioners of Hihyo needed to have, but he could only do that in the negative way. For instance, he says, those who offer personal preference uh, make hair splitting comments or simply skim through recent publications are uh, not qualified, the negative. Writers of summaries and imitations cannot practice hihyo, negative. So the ideal figure of a hihyo, ideal figure of a hihyo practitioner is someone who has a broad range of specialized knowledge and capable of producing something original and yet, clearly, Onishi was not able to name a single figure who would meet such high qualifications. Those gestures on Meiji intellectuals' part were rather prescriptive than descriptive of what Hihyo was. The suggested visions of Hihyo were unrealistically lofty, such that the likelihood of their proper execution appeared almost impossible. Hikyo reached an impasse as soon as it was posited when its practitioners were unable to discern how to proceed. They had to seek out how to be critical readers on their own by debating against each other and experimenting with ways to be critical. So what happened when they began to explore ways of exercising critical reading? What followed the confusion about critical reading practice was, in fact, further confusion. When Meiji intellectuals began to practice hihyo by reading something and then writing about it, their hihyo pieces started to make strange, sometimes even nonsensical movements. When we read hihyo written at the time, many of us would probably feel betrayed we would probably not understand why Meiji writers demonstrated their critical reading in the way they did. Hikyo from that period simply appears surprising, odd, different from what we expect from a typical criticism or critical analysis of something. That said, I must qualify what I mean by Hikyo's strange nonsensical movements. Meiji intellectuals' attempts were met with a lack of compelling outcome, not because they were incompetent to evaluate whatever they were reading, nor because their thoughts were outmoded and incompatible with the Euro Anglo American models of criticism that they pursued. I am also not saying that Hikyo failed because it was premature in the context of Meiji Japan. What I suggest is that if Meiji Japan's hikyo appears to be failure to us. That might speak less about what Meiji intellectuals were doing, but more about what we believe critical reading should look like. I take seriously the initial amorphousness of hikyo and the confusion felt by the Meiji elites as to what they had to do when they read something and exercised hikyo. Meiji's hikyo featured many strange, nonsensical qualities, at least to the eyes of readers of the 21st century. We would think that that was because of the absence of set guidelines about how to practice critical reading. But at the same time, the absence of protocols might counter illuminate our own protocols that we have been taking for granted in our time, in our profession. In that sense, 
Reading Major's Hihyo in our here and now might afford opportunities of reflecting on our own reading practice. And if we start doing that, perhaps we may be able to open ourselves up to divergent possibilities of engaging with a text we read, maybe in ways that we haven't even thought of. I will now turn to the actual case study of what happened as Hihyo, how the confusion manifested, and what sort of strange move that Hihyo made. The case I'm going to introduce is called The Dancing Girl Debate, which is a debate that revolved around a short story, The Dancing Girl. So the story was authored by writer Mori Ogai in 1890. And then Ogai was also a surgeon, a military doctor. And he was also, uh, he, he was a very prolific writer, both in the creative field and in the medical field. The story, is told in the first person narration by the male protagonist Ota, who is a young Japanese elite. And then he's recollecting a romantic yet tragic relationship that he had with a beautiful German dancer, Elise, in the city of Berlin. Soon after The Dancing Girl was published, the author Mori Ogai and the, the leading intellectual at the time, Ishibashi Ningetsu, began to debate over the story's ending and they fought by exchanging hihyo pieces. So these are hihyo essays that Ogai and the Ningetsu exchanged with each other. The Ningetsu's main dissatisfaction with the story was the disconnect between the male protagonist author's personality and his action. That's, that's to say, the inconsistent depiction of the character. In the story, the protagonist Ota abandons his lover Elise, who is pregnant with his child, and he leaves for Japan to take up a new job opportunity. Ningetsu took issue with that, saying that someone like Ota, who has a very weak mind, will not be able to take a bold action such as leaving behind the pregnant lover. And because of the character's inconsistency, Ningetsu concluded that the dancing girl lost the integrity as a work of literature. So receiving the comment from Ningetsu, Ogai, the writer, decided to respond by writing another piece of hihyo. So the exchange then turned into a heated debate. The content of Ningetsu's claim itself appears to be a legitimate argument as critical reading. Regardless of whether we agree with Ningetsu's reading or not, most of us would probably think that what he said about the consistent depiction of the character could be a valid point. It could be an important point. But aside from that, this debate took many strange turns. First of all, these two intellectuals interacted with one another, not as the critic and the author, but as fictional characters. Ningetsu's initial attack was published as a criticism written by a fictional character named Kidori Hanojo. Who is this Kidori Hanojo guy? So Kidori appeared in Ningetsu's own novel, fictional novel, Lady Tsuyuko, which was published in 1889. So Kidori Hanojo in Ningetsu's novel is depicted as a typical comic character who has no clue about what is happening around him. To respond to the attack from this fictional, clownish character, Ogai assumed the persona of another fictional character, which is Aizawa Kenkichi. And then um, Aizawa Kenkichi appears as an important character in the story of the dancing girl. And then if you read the story, you might remember this figure, Aizawa is a protective friend, protective friend of the protagonist Ota. So instead of communicating as a critic and author, Ningetsu and Ogai spoke with each other as fictional characters, Kidori and Aizawa. It was these fictional characters who debated over the coherence of the fictional work, The Dancing Girl, in the space of Hihyo. We would expect that the stable positionality of the critic was crucial in establishing the boundaries of Hihyo, and yet such stability was nowhere to be found in this debate. 
Furthermore, the debate proceeded in an unexpected direction as these fictional characters ended up rewriting the ending of the dancing girl. In the original version, the protagonist Ota leaves his lover in Berlin so that he can re-establish himself as a bureaucrat in the Japanese government. It is this ending that triggered Kidori or Ningetsu's point about the story's weakness. In response to this point, Aizawa uh, slash Ogai made a following very strange comment. And then here I quote, Ota, the protagonist, Ota is weak. It is a fact that he accepted the job offer. However, if he had never fallen ill, and if Elise had never gone mad, Ota might have relinquished the thought of returning to Japan. How would we ever know? If he had given up returning to Japan, perhaps he would have felt deeply ashamed and even killed himself. How do we ever know? So here, the fictional character Aizawa is fictionalizing alternative endings of the story by discussing the what ifs. In other words, fiction is writing fiction. The debate took place in a space assigned to Hihyo for objective assessment of writings. And yet this space was used by the fictional characters to offer alternative fiction. We would think that the autonomy of Hihyo vis-a-vis -vis its object, the divisibility between Hihyo and what it was evaluating was crucial for Hihyo to sustain its privileged status. Despite that, such autonomy could not be sustained and such divisibility was invalidated in this debate. A case like the Dancing Girl debate shows us that in late 19th century Japan, there were no orthodox ways of criticizing and engaging with a piece of publication. I am interested in Major Japan's Hihyo, not because I intend to dwell on its strangeness. Instead, I wish to highlight that Hihyo in late 19th century Japan emerges as that which goes beyond the bounds of logic or at least the bounds of what we now think logical criticism should look like. I have discussed so far that the late 19th century Japan was the age of Hihyo, that Hihyo was recognized as a new critical reading practice in major Japan. And yet, because the critical component of Hihyo had to manifest in an entirely unprecedented way, the confusion arose as to what it means to be critical in one's reading practice. And because of the confusion, Meiji's Hihyo unfolded in a strange direction. So why is it important to look into the emerging process of Hihyo in Japan? Because in its initial struggle to establish a critical reading practice, Japan produced fascinating types of criticism which appears very strange to us now for a lack of a better term. Japanese intellectuals made a concerted effort to appropriate the practice of criticism from their Euro-Anglo-American counterparts. However, when they attempted to criticize something as hihyo, the criticism that they produced ended up manifesting varying types of digression from hihyo's high ideals. I consider that this digression the unexpected unfolding of Hihyo could be understood as a generative move because it affords one point of reference through which we can start reflecting on our own reading practice in the 21st century. Now, I'm going back to um, my original question. Um, I'm going to connect Hihyo's strangeness back to where I started. So in the beginning, I asked, when we have to read something in a critical way, how exactly are we supposed to perform the critical aspect of the reading? So here I want to map out where we are in the current century and then what has been said about critical reading in academic discourses. So as early as the 1960s, Susan Sontag expressed her dissatisfaction with critics' perennial, never consummated project of interpretation. Sontag was frustrated with critics who seemed to be only interested in poking holes in a work of art in the name of critical interpretation. For her, such a model of critical reading equated vandalism. 
Sontag took issue with certain pattern of critical interpretation, the pattern of thinking that later came to be called as a school of hermeneutics of suspicion. The representative figures of the school include Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. As Paul Ricoul puts it, the suspicion-driven interpretations are central to this school, and they make infinite efforts to reveal meanings, either camouflaged or erased. This is because to the suspicious minds, the consciousness is primarily false. Suspicion prompts the desire to read symptoms in the text. In 2009, Stephen Best and Sharon Marcus identified the dominant reading methodology among the scholars of literature as symptomatic reading, which takes meaning to be hidden, repressed, deep, and in need of detection and disclosure by an interpreter. Bruno Latour states that this mode of reading is reductive and repeatable, applicable to any text. He summarized the cookie cutter conclusion that any suspicious or symptomatic reading method would be likely to reach, which is there is no sure ground anywhere. So against the predominance of suspicious or symptomatic paranoid reading practices, many alternative models have been proposed. And then I'll include here some example. Sontag, for instance, does not simply reject hermeneutics. Instead of excavating and then violating the text, she advocates an erotics of art that allows criticism to show how it is, what it is, even that it is, what it is, rather than to show what it means. So the whole issue of literary studies journal representations is dedicated to various methods of surface reading aforementioned the best and the Marcus essay serves as an introductory note to the issue of uh, representations. And then according to best and the Marcus, surface reading asks how we can become attentive to the surfaces, not the depths of the text that have been rendered invisible by symptoms, symptomatic readings. We can also count Franco Moletti's call to distant reading. Distant reading shows no interest in interpretation of texts, be it reading more of the text or reading the text more closely. Instead, distant reading approaches the text as components, trends, and collectible data. Scanning these discussions, Rita Felsky delineates the limits of the dominant styles of critical thinking. Now broadly grasped as first critical reading, a body of Felsky's scholarship poses revitalizing questions. What can we generate out of our reading experiences instead of zapping down everything we read? How could we as professional readers engage with what we read without suppressing our affective responses such as attachment, enchantment, and shock? How can we articulate a positive vision for humanistic thought and then recognize the potential of literature and art to create new imaginaries? These questions are urgent ones when the humanities disciplines need to defend their values more than ever. We live in the post-critical age in which we are pressed to think and then rethink what it is to read something and then be critical about it. And this is where the comparison between our time and the late 19th century Japan kicks in because Japanese intellectuals were grappling with the same question. What does critical reading might look like? And what does that take to be critical? Meiji's Hihyo shows us multiple possibilities for reading precisely because it was not bound by the set formula of what critical reading needed to be. The young intellectuals of the late 19th century didn't know how exactly they would perform what they needed to perform. So they experimented with various ways of being critical, consciously or not. They took divergent path and showed what could happen in the name of criticism, what criticism could become. What took place as hihyo in that context takes us beyond what we think we already know about critical reading. In the strange movements of Meiji's hihyo, we can read moments that may unwind us from the familiar standards of how we do what we do in our critical reading. 
I have discussed the case of late 19th century Japan in the hope of offering the experience of being lifted from the pressure for having to be critical in a certain way. To read Meiji's Hihyo means to be confronted by different manifestations of trying to be critical, which helps us to reflect on how our critical practice might be prescribed, structured, and delimited. And then those are also possibilities of inquiring into how else we may be able to perform our reading and, by extension, forming a relationship with texts that we read. So it would be really great if we could start thinking about how we read and how we may be able to read in a differently critical way together. I welcome questions and comments, and I also want to ask if any of you has suggestions about how we can approach the text we read in variously critical ways. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Goto, for that really um, rich and I think uh, destabilizing talk. <laughs> um, I am gonna, we have, I'm gonna give the audience a, few, a little bit more time for questions to come in. Some are coming in, but um, I think many of us are kind of still digesting. Um, what you've put forth and I'm so I would like to ask an easy one um, just listening throughout the talk a lot of the uh, discussion of the putative strangeness of Hiho was framed in terms of what our 21st century expectations might be as readers um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more beyond sort of the received tradition of Chinese learning about the contemporary Western discourses in the late 19th century that were that these Meiji intellectuals were thinking about or writing against or writing with as they worked to develop their own ideas of what Hiho was. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, so as I, you know, a lot of when you talked about how Hiho was strange, it was set up in terms of it's strange to us as 21st century thinkers. Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk about it, not um, from another angle too, in terms of how was Hiho, what was Hiho evolving in response to or in conversation with in terms of quote unquote Western discursive trends of that time? Because you talked a little bit about Chinese thought, but presumably Hiho didn't just appear out of nowhere, right, as a goal. So could you give us basically just a little bit more kind of intellectual context from the Meiji period? I mean, is it strange? Is it strange to everyone all the time or is it only strange to us? Um, well, the, the short answer is that um, yes, it sounds strange to us, um, but um, in the context of the late 19th century, Japanese intellectuals were, were Many of them um, just didn't didn't know what to do, what to say. They they um is, is that the character or is that the um is that a certain use of language that they need to focus on when you read something and then like you know start thinking about like you know engaging with the text um and then they were not sure what to do really and then um and then that. And then that prompted the, the high ideals and then also the confusion. Um, so, um, so of course, many of them were reading um, the criticism that, the, um, that were practiced in, in the Euro-Anglo-American context. So Onishi, uh, for instance, he was reading Kant. Um, he was also uh, reading Matthew Arnold and trying to to explain, trying to digest, and then trying to exercise his own version of Hihyo, um, but simply um, they also um, the struggle. Their struggle was not just the conceptual one because they also needed to create the language. The the, the language they could use to talk about um, the text they are reading. Um, so in many ways, there, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of things that they needed to figure out before they could like start 
okay, I'm going to focus on the structure of this piece to, to, to deconstruct or to, to criticize, to do hihyo. Um, so so th does that answer your question, I wonder? But I don't want to monopolize the whole question and answer time. We do always talk about this more. Um, okay. Because some we do have a question from the audience. So let me okay. open it up. Um, I won't identify people unless you tell me to please do so. I mean, you the askers. Um, mm -hmm. So um, this comes in. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. I find it very interesting that Shoyol and other intellectual leaders regarded Hichol as a Western practice. Is this related to the absence of the traditions of rhetoric and argumentation in Confucianism and other major strands of Asian thought? Wait, there's more. I just want to give you a second to digest that. Um, and then the asker follows this up by saying, isn't it the case that Hichol was often taken too personally as an attempt to insult and shame the author in part because people had no idea about what it means to disagree mm -hmm. since there was a was a strong norm for consensus and agreement. I think this phenomenon exists in the US, but is likely to be salient in Japan. My Japanese colleagues seem to avoid intellectual exchange to be nice to one another. I see this in Michigan too, but it's more common in Japan, so it seems. And let me give you just one little tag on at the end from the questioner. In addition, I found it very interesting that there was a strong interest in books in the Meiji era already. I wonder whether the interest in books and hikyo on them might extend to ordinary people beyond young intellectuals, correspondingly what the literacy rate then might have been. So I know that's a lot there to mm -hmm. parse. Um, since it was also in the chat bar, I will turn it over to you. Okay, okay. Let me let me go back to the first part of the question. Um, Um, yes. Um, um, I would say that um, the most important thing for major intellectuals was uh, like they 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 needed to do something completely unfamiliar, something that they that never that, that something that had never really occurred to them um and then um so there might be uh, I, I mean there were genealogies of like you know commentaries and then um you know annotations in um in their in their genealogies in their in their traditions of knowledge and then I'm not um, familiar with like you know the argumentation or Confucianism, so um, I cannot talk about that. But um, they really wanted to, or they posited a hihyo um, as a Western practice or something that had never happened in Japan. In that sense, they had to create something completely new, and then, and then, um, and then they they that the easier is easier way for them to do it is to negate what they were familiar with. So it's not annotations, it's not uh, commentaries, it's not like this or that, um, but I can't talk about it in the positive language because I can't do it myself. Um, so, so, so that I hope answers the first part of the question. And then uh, to personally as an attempt to insult and shame the author in part because mm. sorry just to remind the audience this part of the question is dealing with is the is there the fact that there's not a tradition of disagreement in Japan is that mm -hmm. also causing difficulties for Hihyo practitioners mm -hmm. yes um I would say that, well, for instance, I talked about the debate between um, Ogai and the Ningetsu, and then uh, they disagreed with a lot of things, or at least rhetorically, they, they, they created the appearance of, of the fight. Um, but at the same time, they were aware that they were gaining something um, by publicly staging their fight um 
Now, most obviously, they could be famous by writing for public journals, intellectual journals, and then um, they were also studying German, German literature, and then um, German um, intellectual traditions. So they could also promote the German studies by arguing about the text that took place in, in, in Germany. Um, so they, they knew that uh, what they were doing. So um, it's hard to take the disagreement that took place on paper at this time period completely at a face value as disagreement. Um, they were, um, they, they knew that they, they, they were very well aware that uh, they were doing it for their own sake, like, you know, disagree, disagreeing with each other and then publicizing the disagreement. Um, so I just realized that I'm not quite answering the question. Um, Um, okay, so my, my, my response, short version, is that um, um, some of them, some of them took advantage of the idea of disagreement, um, and then that existed um, in Japan um, at that time, and then I would think that uh, that, that, that exists still now. Uh, okay, moving on to the final part of the question. Um, And again, just to remind the audience, this is about sort of broader potential audience for mm -hmm. books in the Meiji period. Mm -hmm. So the question of the literacy, um, this is also a very interesting time period because uh, they had to come to terms with, uh, they have to come, come to the terms with the linguistic diversity. For, um, for instance, someone like Ogai, um, he was very literate, so he could read um, classical Chinese text, and then he could read German and English. Um, the general public, uh, they were able to, the general public, it's hard to define the general public because um, there are different levels of literacy. Um, and then the journals and then these print media that I, I featured in my talk, uh, they were, most of the, the journals that I talked about were targeting um, the higher, high literate people, um, the, you know, um, the, um, the younger generations of the former samurai class, um, and then uh, the, the, the student, the college students, um, and then, so like, if we are really talking about the general general public, then uh, those people could not read the, those journals. Um, they couldn't, they, they were not able to read um, because of their literacy rate. Um, um, and then uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions about like, you know, language reforms on um, towards the end of uh, the 19th century. So um, many of the people, the general general public were able to, for instance, hiragana. Um, when it comes to the mixture of like, you know, hiragana and then kanji and then like kanbun kundokutai, then um, the number uh, of the people who were able to read those things um, just like dropped significantly. Um, Um, and then, um, uh, but um, short version, um, the, the literacy, um, I think that like generally the, the how to write um, Japanese language. So the discussion came to an end just around the turn of, turn of the century. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, sorry. I I just want to encourage people to send in questions and I apologize if I butcher this somehow because 
here at Michigan, we are teaching in person and we have been in person just long enough for me to lose any Zoom literacy I had. So just a second, let me see if I can get things up and running. Okay, yes, we have another question from the audience. Um, this is a two-parter. So the first is it's, um, first of all, the person says, thank you for the stimulating talk. Um, one, it's hard not to hear the story you tell as related to concerns about performing a certain form of elite masculinity in a context where pre-Meiji social and sexual norms had shifted, see Keith Vincent's arguments. How does this desire shape the discourse or even formal features of hyo, especially compared to work by female critics of the time or since? And then here's part two. <laughs> what do you think of the more popular modes of criticism now via social media, et cetera? It seems to jive with your argument that kihyo is that which exceeds logic, but I also wonder about the economic incentive to produce text, more as product reviews and trolling than thoughtful commentary per se. So that's another two, two pronged question. Um, take it away. Let's tackle with the first question. So uh, the gender of the language and then uh, the modes of writing. Um, yes, the people that I talk about, uh, they are all male, even though they were writing for like the women's magazine that tried to promote women's status and then education um, in the major period. Um, it was extremely gendered. Um, and then when I said the young generation of the former samurai class, I was referring to the male um, boys. Um, and then, maybe I should put this question, even formal features of Kisho. Um, and then, um, how does this desire shape the discourse? Even formal features of Kisho. Um, um, so one, one good example is um, the journal that I talked about, The Nation's Friend. So the title of the journal um, that Tokutomi Soko published, like he, he, was, he founded this journal as The Nation's Friend. But is it really The Nation's Friend uh, when the most of the readers were young, male, well-educated um, people? Um, and then uh, Soho was um, criticized by that, uh, but that voice, the voice of crit criticism, um, the voice that attacked Soho uh, was very, was, was in, in many ways silenced because the nation's friend and then Soho's rhetoric was just so powerful at the time. Um, Hihyo, at the time and then uh, ever since, I would say it, it's, it, it's very gendered. It, it's a very gendered field or realm. Um, it's, pro, um, it's male dominated, um, even when um, they talk about women um, and the women's suffrage, women's education. Um, so, uh, since um, I, I don't think it has changed at this point. Um, still, uh, we can still see the the, the gendered language in, in the Kikyo produced at, uh, right now. Um, number two, the more popular modes of criticism now. Again, just to remind the audience, this part is about <laughs> the now popular social modes of criticism, especially mm -hmm. via social media. Mm -hmm. Um, social media commentary. Um, I have no. It looks like we have uh, a technical difficulty, at least on my end. Um, could one of the panelists let me know if? Okay, we have lost uh, Professor Dr. Goto. Um, I'm trusting that she will rejoin us as soon as possible. So keep those questions coming in. Um, 
as we reflect on the nature of hiho and what it might mean for us to read critically in the post-critical age. All right, she has beamed back aboard. I'm sorry, um, I don't know why I'm stuck in Star Trek land. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm let's sorry. Let's see. What did I miss? So, no, no, you didn't miss anything. You missed awkward me filling the moments with kind of rambles. Um, so uh, you, you were talking about um, current popular modes of criticism oh, okay. in social media and so on and so forth. And this questioner had said that they also wondered about the economic incentive to produce mm -hmm. um, text more as mm -hmm. product reviews and trolling than thoughtful commentary per se. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if you had anything Okay. Um, okay. Else, you would like to <laughs> add on to that. Um, so I was just saying that uh, if we if you look back on uh, what happened in the name of hiho or criticism or like, uh, then we can we can see many moments that were like genuinely thought provoking, um, or um, you know thoughtful, and then um, and then uh, really refreshing. And then I would really like that if um, we could productively inherit those moments into the new modes of producing criticism, like regardless of what it might look like, like if it's a text message or if it's the social media, but still we, I would re really like to see some sort of like self-reflective um, um, moments in the new realms as well. Just listening to your response, I'm wondering if social media critiques really are self-reflective. But um, you know, just... but like, but don't you think that it would make a huge difference, like in this world, if every writer was like actually giving it a thought, like of what it might do, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's <laughs> pursuing this social media line. You have another question. I'm going to condense it just slightly, but the questioner is asking about a particular Reddit page where people can share situations and ask the audience to judge who was right or wrong. Um, and the questioner says, I really appreciated your whole presentation, but in particular, I started to wonder if 1890s Meiji social turmoil might be at all parallel with the social changes we might be experiencing now. I would happy to hear any thoughts you might be willing to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 1880s social turmoil and then our social turmoil, uh, I would assume that the audience is asking about the United States, like. I, I, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, and then it's somewhat similar to the previous question about what we do using other other forms of um, producing texts. Um, yeah. Let's see. But um, as the other day, I was just thinking about the cancel culture. And then, um, you know, nowadays you may not even write anything and then you just cancel whatever you disagree with. Um, and then that might work um, to some extent, but does it solve the, all, all the problems? Um, again, I would really like that uh, if we could together start thinking about then how else we would engage with um, what we are dealing with, um, whether it's, it's a textual, you know, um, um, mode or like, you know, something else that we are dealing with. Um, it would be, it would be really nice if we just like, like put on hold our, you know, negative responses or like, you know, uh, this is bad or like, you know, if we can just like put on hold for a moment and then uh, start different ways to relate to the thing that you, that you are dealing with or the, the thing that it, that's in front of you. And then, um, then maybe 
then maybe if we start doing that, um, something might change. <laughs> um, um, yeah, yeah, let's let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm let's see, we have a couple more minutes. So if we have any other audience questions, um, please send those in. If not, I'm gonna um, again, while I give people a little time to think, I want to follow up on that then with, this is something that actually came up in my class yesterday and we were talking about an earlier critical response to a reading that we did, which the students by and large felt was lacking. Mm -hmm. And then what kinds of things that they would want to see in a critical response instead. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what you would like to see us bring then to, if we were to all practice Hisho now, mm -hmm. What kinds of things would you want us as we stop the as we set aside the negative and then start mm -hmm. engaging critically in a different way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to think about like you know our like you know I don't want to like how can I say this like whenever I read like you know academic journals, um, oftentimes the language the language the language used is very dry and then to some extent that makes sense right because you you have to like be objective but at the same time i want to see like you know what is this person actually like you know feeling so like that kind of something something more personal is not the right word intimate maybe visceral or like affective um i i wonder like if we can start thinking about our practice like in those terms like uh, so so that's definitely one one way i would like to proceed when i write my piece um And then we can also think about different kinds of venues. Like it doesn't need to like, of course, we have to get tenure, then <laughs> we have to get promoted. So yeah, I'm like, not trying we, to get you to say anything awkward <laughs> that we have to edit out of the talk later. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, like, like we um we have to publish it through certain venues that are considered like academic enough. Um, but at the same time, um I wonder if the model of production of knowledge will be will be sustainable in in the future um maybe after i get tenured <laughs> i will i will start exploring um the different kind of like the different kind of venue the different kind of language that is more recep receptive to um the the what what I am actually feeling about the the text that I'm reading. Great. Thank you. I look forward to that conversation in an undisclosed number of years. <laughs> <laughs> I it looks like our host is now also having technical difficulties. We are having some kind of Zoom curse today. Mm -hmm. So I am going to suggest though, since it is 126, and I don't want to make everybody just listen to me asking you questions. I'll just do that off camera. <laughs> so I will ask everybody to please join me in thanking you remotely one more time, and then we will wrap up today's lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Goto, for that Thank you fascinating very much for talk. having me. <laughs> it was our pleasure. All right, take care. <laughs>